Let's take a look at making a hammer based on the tools in the Master Mirror Find. And the one that I would like to do today is identified as number 65 in the book, The Master Mirror Find. And it's one of the lighter hammers in the book. There's actually a hammer in here that they, comes close to eight pounds, a pretty big hammer. But this one is more in the one and a half pound range. It's uh, 724 grams. And lengthwise, it's 16.6 centimeters. This is all measured in centimeters in the book. It is 2.9 centimeters tall, which is an inch, about an inch and an eighth, and 3.8 centimeters wide, which is about an inch and a half wide. But a lot of this looks like mushrooming through use, so I don't know that the original hammer was really that big right there or not. I'm going to try and make what I think it would have looked like new, as opposed to trying to make a hammer that was well used and buried in the ground for over a thousand years. But in keeping with the spirit of the original tools, we're going to go ahead and use wrought iron for this. This is a piece of wrought iron that one of you folks sent me some time back. And then for the face and for the peen, I've got this piece of 1045 that I will cut a piece off of and forge to match this. Then whatever I learn from this hammer, I'll apply those techniques to the next hammer we do. But for now, we're going to cut this, and we're going to do this in the coal fire because my gas forge doesn't quite get hot enough to forge weld wrought iron. Now, as cut, my tool steel bit and my wrought iron weigh right at two pounds. So I'm a little heavier than the one and a half pound hammer, but there's going to be loss to scale, especially during forge welding. There's always weight of the material lost. And then there'll be loss in the final trimming and grinding and finishing of the hammer. So hopefully, we won't lose more than about a half a pound, and we'll end up with a hammer pretty close to the right size. this to be as wide as my other material, so I don't want to go too far. I'm getting real close. I also want to make sure it isn't hollow in the middle, which is the natural side effect I'm getting here. So I'm going to kind of bevel that off to guarantee that when I weld this, that I have a high spot to make contact first, and that'll help squeeze out any flux or other junk. Okay, that'll work. And then that, this extra bit here is what will get turned into the steel for the peen, which is probably more than I need, but we'll take it. And just because that will get tapered eventually, I'm just go ahead and start doing that while it's connected. Now before we cut this apart, I'm going to put some teeth in the top of the, the face. And to put the teeth in, we're just going to put it in the vise here and use this diamond point chisel. It's kind of a big engraving tool. And just raise some fairly big burrs here. Hopefully this will help keep it from falling apart while we bring it up to welding heat. Now of course my little teeth here are not as sharp and pointy as I might like. So there's a chance they will not grab hold of this other bar the way I want them to. No, not going to stick. That's too bad. 
So what does that mean my options are? I either try to pull these out of the fire at welding heat and line them up, which might work, might not. Or I let myself have a little tiny tack weld from the MIG welder, and I think that's where I'm going to go, just to guarantee that we get this done today. But for future ones, I'm going to try and figure out a way to make this stick. I'll need a better chisel to raise better teeth. So it's just a little tack weld there to keep the tool steel on the end of the wrought iron bar. We'll be able to go ahead and do the forge weld. Certainly that's not the way the Vikings would have done it, but this is the first time I've ever done a hammer this way, so I've got some learning to do on how to make that stay. Just a little bit of flux. So that has that at least stuck. I think we're going to flux it and do it again. Now it's important to remember that wrought iron has a much higher heat range and welds at a higher heat than the tool steel does. There's a little tiny overlap in where those temperatures are, so you don't want to overheat the tool steel while bringing the wrought iron up to heat. To do that, the best thing to do is to keep the wrought iron part in the hottest part of the fire past the tool steel beyond that hot spot and let it come up to heat just a little bit more slowly. I have managed to burn that tool steel just a little bit, but it was quite large so I think I can fix that still. You already see how much this is upsetting, so that should get me the dimensions that I really wanted for the hammer. And so far that weld's looking pretty darn good. I think I'll take one more welding heat, just try to clean that up a little bit. It's really looking pretty darn good, I think. We started off with six and a half inches of wrought iron and about three quarters of an inch of tool steel. And after doing some upsetting, we're now down to five and three quarters of an inch. And our one inch dimension is now an inch and a quarter square. I think I would like to upset this just a little bit more and that will allow me a little bit more leeway in forging the final hammer. So let's put this back in, bring it up to welding heat again. It's also important to remember that wrought iron is forge welded in the first place, so you should always work the wrought iron hot anyways. Yeah, did that get any shorter? You know, we took another quarter inch out of it. I think we're ready to go ahead and punch the eye in this. I'm just going to use an oval punch or large slot punch to do this because I think that's probably the technology that the originals would have used. 
And I'm going to go centered at this point, which means when we draw out the pin, it'll be a little bit beyond center. And that's in keeping with the scale drawing in the book. What I'm really doing now is trying to get a mark established so I can get this back up to heat. Yeah, we should be able to find that. Hole to help break the punch free. Not sticking yet, but it might. Also cooling the punch off a little bit between turns. If you turn it, it helps keep the punch going straight. Whatever your natural error is, is canceled out every time you turn it around. Probably ready to punch through from the other side. our slug. I'm going to go ahead and start drifting this, but I won't finish it until we're done with the peen in. I also notice there's some small cracks opening up here, which is typical salvaged wrought iron. Whether we can save it or not remains to be seen. Let's see if we can get in there and seal that back up again. Hopefully that'll do it. Probably had it a little too low of the heat while we were doing the punching. Wrought iron is different to work than mild steel is. Some people love it. Personally, I've never been wild about it. That's enough of that. We'll finish cleaning that eye up after we do the peen. So what I want to do for the peen is I want to draw this out all from one side. It's fairly flat on the bottom and then we'll split it and insert that piece of tool steel. Right now I'm just taking another pass at that place where the weld was splitting a little bit. Getting a little bit of delamination there at the end as well, even though it's at a good high heat.
But since we're going to be forge welding that, I have high hopes. Next thing I want to do is split that for the cut or the peen. So we'll just take a chisel and try to split that down the middle. You can certainly see where it's starting to come apart here. One of the main reasons I don't like working in wrought iron, it has its issues. Some people love it. I don't. But it does split nicely. I'm just going to bring that down onto the cutting edge, and that sets those teeth in pretty nicely. I'm going to go clean out the fire for the third time today, and then we'll weld this. Start by driving that wedge in just a little bit more. That went much better than the face weld did. I think we'll go ahead and take another pass at it just to be sure. For the most part, that's all it needs. I'm going to put a little bit of a contour in here, I think, just because the, the original has it. I think I might upset that just a little bit more. We should be at six and a half inches. We're actually at seven, so we ended up a little bit too long. I'm not actually going to get much of an upset out of that. It's kind of thin for that. But it won't be a half bad hammer. I still have a little bit of a delamination in the wrought iron right at the eye. So I'm going to put that back in and see if I can fix that. I'll start with just a little bit of flux in there. This may not work, but I suspect if I were a Viking trying to make a hammer, I wouldn't care about that. It's probably not going to be the ruin of the hammer. I'm just going to work the edges of the eye down with a rounding hammer and hope that that Seals that little crack up. Try and treat the other side the same. And then we're going to have to re drift the eye.
want to work too hard on that as I don't want to crack it any further. Yeah, I can still see a telltale sign of that delamination there. That may be a problem. But like I say, I'm not sure if a Viking would have cared too much. Working down to a lower heat, very gentle blows, helps break the scale off. It leads for a smoother finish. Well, I'm going to let that cool down and normalize and I'll take a closer look at it tomorrow and then I'll see if I think that delamination is the end of the hammer or if it's just part of the character of the hammer. It really isn't all that uncommon to see some of those flaws and the characteristics of wrought iron and some of those early tools so I may not worry about it too much but we'll see. Then we'll pick this up with the hardening, the tempering and a little bit of finish work on this hammer in a second video which should be next Friday. So if you want to see what this hammer looks like finished, make sure you come back and join us then. In the meantime, I hope you have time in your day to get out to your shop. But stay safe, wear your safety glasses. We'll see you for the next one.